With that, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The one who was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice to make us right with you, our Heavenly Father. And now, Lord, we, we honor those who in the same vein have given their lives for the freedoms we enjoy. You tell us in your word there's no greater love than this that one would lay down his life for his friend. And so today we, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for the commitment to the call. We thank you for freedom that rules and reigns around the world. In those places where oppression reigns, would you intervene? Would you send your troops? And would you forge the path of freedom, dignity, and responsibility? I pray that you'd raise the standard of righteousness in our hearts here in America, here in the South Bay, and across this world. Grant courage, grant hope, and would you come alongside your people. <clears throat> Protect, guard, keep and guide each one of them in your care. We thank you for this now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And Father, as we turn our attention to your word, I pray that you would speak to each of us where we are at today, that you would make yourself known, that your word would truly be what it is, the living, vibrant word of God that's faithful, endures forever, and brings about the purposes you intend in each of our lives. I thank you that we can speak in the confidence that what you've begun, you're faithful to complete until the, till the day we're with you forever. Grant this we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So good to have each and every one of you here today. If you have our Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. That's going to be our text as we continue the final seven days of Jesus' life. They call it the Passion Week. And really what it is, where every detail and every event event paves the way of God's redemption through Jesus for mankind. And so far we've talked and looked at the weekend before, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. So the week prior on Saturday and Sunday, Jesus works his way to Bethany. He spends some time with, with friends that are there with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and uh, there's so many people coming to Jerusalem for the Passover event. They hear of Jesus and what he's been doing, and they heard about a man that was raised from the dead. There's this great excitement, so they're going and kind of get in on the action, see what's taking place. And so on Monday morning, Jesus comes down to Jerusalem to start the, the f festivities for the week of Passover, and as he comes down, they lay out these palm branches and they coordinate him as the king. They believe he's going to be an earthly king, but he comes down to reign in the hearts and the lives and the minds of mankind. And then he works his way to the temple and he cleanses the temple on that Monday morning, overturns the tables and says, listen, my house is a place to connect with my father. It's a place of intimacy. Don't make it something that it isn't. He works his way back to Bethany and the next day he comes down and he sees a barren fig tree and he curses it and it withers immediately and just reminding us that God demands fruit from the lives of those who put their hope and their trust in him. If you know the Lord and God's alive and well in you, it'll bear the mark and fruit of his presence and his image in everything we do. He then makes his way back to the temple and the religious leaders are upset with him saying, who are you to kind of come in here and clean house and who gave you the right to do this to make the wholesale changes you're asking for and he says my credentials as a son of God give me that authority and then he goes and gives them an opportunity to repent and make themselves right with God and he gives them three parables we talked about the parable of the two sons and how actions speak louder than words it's not enough to say the right things we got to do what God has called us to do amen you know, the, our walk talks and our talk talks, but our walk talks louder than our talk talks, right? For those of you who haven't heard that before, that's true. 
And then he gave them the parable of the landowner. We talked about that last week. And now, if we're not broken before God, we'll be broken by God. And it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews tells us. And today, he talks about the parable of the wedding feast. And if I were to title this message, it would be, Be My Guest. With that in mind, let's take a look at Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Jesus, again, wanted to penetrate their hearts spoke to them in parables, saying, why does he speak in a parable? Because he's given them a, a real-life illustration or an example, something they can relate to that they can attach truth to and implement in their daily living. And so he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. The king would be representative of the father. Of course, the son is Jesus. He sent his messengers, that's anybody who shares the truth of Jesus Christ, to the invited people. This is the household of faith, people who've been given so much by God. And he sent, he invited them, but they were not willing to come. In verse 4, it says, again, he sent other slaves, saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock, are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. And so those slaves, these messengers of the king, went out into the streets, and they gathered together all that they found, both evil and good, it didn't matter, and they invited them, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. It says, then the king came to look over the dinner guests and he saw a man who was there who was not dressed in wedding clothes and he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was caught speechless. And then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into outer darkness in that place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen. Let's unpack this truth today and see what it means for us here in the 21st century. And we'll be focusing this morning on the feast, the invitations, and the responses. So we start with the wedding feast itself. And this wedding feast is used by our Lord because it was a special event that had a place of significance in the society of those with whom he was sharing. And it's true for us as well. Weddings are a great thing, a very special occasion. It's a celebration. In fact, if you think of a wedding, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Let me just have some responses. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of a wedding? Cake, cake, sweets. There's somebody there is dear to my heart. What else? Love. Okay, good. Love, what else? Exchange of vows. I heard somebody say money. (laughs) Oh, my bad, my bad. (laughs) What was that? Ryan. Ryan? Oh, crying, that's hilarious, all right. A lot of different things. And when Jesus used this example, it invoked in the hearts and the minds of his hearers these same types of feelings or emotions or something they could connect with. First of all, a wedding ceremony is a celebration. It's something we, as they spend time planning and looking forward to with great anticipation. In fact, the average State of, what do you call it now? I forgot, I can't even, my mind my, my, my blank. When you're married, you're not married, you're engaged. Gee, oh my golly. <laughs> the average length of engagement is 10 to 17 months, or 18 months. They estimate that the average couple spends 200 to 300 hours planning their wedding event. They've got to consider the venue. They've got to consider, consider the photographer, the reception, the music, the florist, the videographer, 
the wedding dress, the groom's attire, the wedding cake, the ceremony site, and the list goes on, on and on and on, and the cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. Not to mention the wedding day, wedding day hair care. Right? Okay. I've been to enough weddings now to know that there's an expense involved there. Makeup. And here it is. When we talk about the wedding feast with God, it's significant. And it needs to get our attention because we're talking about all the time, all the energy, and all the expense he's put into sharing his glory with his people. He's inviting us to this marriage feast. He's put time in. He's put expenses in, in place. And he's inviting us to share in his goodness and his glory in everything that makes him God. The wedding feast also included a ceremony of commitment. Somebody said that of love. Now, weddings are a little bit different today than they were then. In the times of Christ, for the Jewish family, a typical wedding would be two to three days. Sometimes it would be a, a feast that lasted seven days. They knew how to enjoy the ceremony of commitment. It's a public testimony of affection that we are committing our lives one to another till death to us part. It's the entrance into a covenant between God one another, and fellow man. And I've often wondered, in fact, I used to feel guilty because I would do weddings and I would spend two hours on a Thursday to meet with a couple and I would marry them on Saturday and I felt like, what in the world am I doing? We're preparing for a wedding, but we need help getting ready for marriage. A life together. And from then on, I said, listen, I can't do that anymore. We're going to have a, a four-week time just to get real practical about life. And if it helps, great. If it doesn't, well, at least it pieces my conscience. I want to give you something to not prepare for a day, but prepare for a lifetime of love and commitment and self-sacrifice. You see, it's not just the event that's significant, but the commitment the event represents over a lifetime. And I don't believe it's coincidence that the very first miracle that Jesus performed was at a wedding in Cana of Galilee where he turned the water into wine and where it's such an important event that Mary was saying, listen, we're going to run out of wine. We're going to be embarrassed. This is family we're talking about. Can you do something, Jesus? He says, my time has not yet come. What time? The time we're talking about right now. The time when he was going to give his life for his people. And she says, your time may not have come, but we need some help right now. And he told the servants, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Some of the great, greatest counsel you'll ever see, receive in life. You want to live a life that's worthy and honorable before God? Just do whatever Jesus tells you to do. So concerned was Mary with her not being prepared. She turned to her son Jesus. And it is at this event, this wedding feast, that Jesus draws our attention to because God wants us to appreciate not just the event, but the sacrifice, the grace, and the love this feast typifies. God providing for us. God lavishing us with his grace. Why? All in hopes of establishing an eternal covenant with us that spans the time of eternity. He talks about the wedding feast and what's the focus? He's given an invitation for us to respond. Thirdly, a wedding feast was one of the best ways to represent life in community where we have, when I think of a wedding, I think of quality time with quality people. That whenever we go, we get to get reacquainted with people that we love so dearly. A wedding feast is an expression of love. In fact, what do we do when we prepare for a wedding? We get ready to send out invitations. We sit down. We think about people that we want to share in this magnificent event. And share in our lives. And it's not uncommon at the reception for the honored couple to make their, their way around the entire room. And talk with every single person and let them know how much they mean to them. And how honored they are to have them at this incredible expression of love. 
It's a special event because of the deep-seated feelings of love for all involved. And in thinking about this, I personally was moved this past week as I was listening to the fish. I don't always listen to the fish, but this particular week I was in the car and happened to hear a song come up. And right when I turned the music on, as I was contemplating the marriage feast, and the w- lyrics of the song were this, If you want to know how much you mean to me, Jesus, just look at my hands and my feet. You see, a wedding feast talks about life in community and how much Christ longs for that with us and what he was willing to pay. You see, when it comes to a wedding feast, we'd be wise to consider the cost. I'm surprised that wasn't one of the number one answers. The average wedding in America today costs $357. I'm just kidding, that's not true. The average wedding in America today costs $33,931. There's some that take place that less is spent. There's some that take place that much more is spent. And the average cost for the weddings that are taking place around the country even today is $33,931. And can I say for those involved, it's worth the expense. It's something we plan for. And, and we want the best yeah, of. In, in our text, our Heavenly Father, the King, isn't bellyaching over the cost. I hope we got that. He's like, I can't believe I put this feast together and it cost me so much. I can't believe how much I got to spend on all these people. That's not as hard at all. He's not bellyaching about the cost. He's celebrating the cost. It's worth it. He's happy to do this. He wants those invited to come and attend and be a part of this great celebration. And what is he appalled at? He's appalled at the lackadaisical lackadaisical response of those for whom he has given so much. They were worth it to him. I hope we see this in the text. Over and over, the king communicates their value to him but he isn't worth it to them. And I want us to get a glimpse into the heart of the Father here. We send out invitations and we think about people that are dear to us and that we want to be in our own ceremonies. And at a wedding, every guest is an honored guest. Yet, a wedding party can expect the same amount of people that they send out invitations to. So if you send out 150 invitations to over 300 people, you can expect the number of invitations you send out to be in attendance. So if you invited 300 people and you send out 150 invitations, sometimes a group of four may come. But that means another group of four you invited won't show up. All are valued, but not all will be our guests. There will be some who will not be there. In fact, one of my biggest regrets in ministry is I was a youth pastor, and one of our young people who was, felt the call of ministry, he's actually a worship pastor today, and, and he called me and said, Dane, I'm going to be getting married, and I would be honored if you would officiate the ceremony. Now, if you can't do it, I understand because it's going to be on a Sunday morning because that's where we could afford it. We were on a budget and we'd get the best deal on a Sunday morning during church. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm a, I'm a pastor and on Sunday morning I got obligations and so I, I'm not going to be able, I don't think I can get the time away. And so I regrettably declined the, the opportunity and he understood and we served in ministry together and we're still really, really good friends. But today I find myself and I say, God, I missed it. Here was a once in a lifetime opportunity to be a part of their union, of their calling together. And I let the busyness of ministry get in the way of this special event. And I'm 
just not that important even on a Sunday morning. There's other people that can teach. There's other people that can serve. There's other people that can lead. And when God grants the opportunity, I've made a covenant with God from that time forward. Whenever somebody asks me to do it, I'm just, I'll do it. There's others who can serve and do their thing. I want to be a part of what God is putting together in the sanctity of marriage. And I've always felt the same is true with God. He longs to be a part of the best of times in our lives. You see, when it comes to putting God first, here's the message of this wedding feast parable. When it comes to putting God first, lay everything else down. He's talking to the people of God. He's talking to people who've been invited to the wedding ceremony. And when it comes to putting God first, he's urging those his hearers, he's urging us today to lay everything else down and attend our Father's bidding. In other words, he's worth the very best of our time, the best of our attention, the best of our resources and on our daily lives. And his prayer and his desire is that our daily lives would show it. That's the significance of the event. Now let's take a look at the invitations. The special people that are invited to attend. You see, the invitation itself speaks of and communicates value. And I want us to see that in God's eyes, we are all his honored guests. And I want us to get the point here because I think what would transform our lives more than anything else is not thinking how much we can show our love for God, but when we understand how much God loves us. When we realize I'm not searching for God all this time, God's been hunting me down to have fellowship with me. Why? Because he values us immensely greatly. Do you see yourselves as the, as the apple of God's eye? The fairest of 10,000. As the object of his affection. As a chosen people. A royal priesthood. The love of his life. For every guest, that's what he's communicating when we say God loves us, the last seven days of Jesus' life is all the proof we need what he was willing to go through to bring us into fellowship with him and make this feast available to you and me. And notice how in our text, how the script of the invitations broadens the broadening scope of the invitations. It starts out with the invited guests. This is the people of God. And I want to make a couple of points here. Number one, notice it's a targeted invitation at first. And this to me speaks to the benefit of the household of faith. And, and let me make four quick observations here. First of all, being raised up in God's house, being raised up in a family, a Christian home, has great benefits because it opens us up to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It gives us advantages of having listening ears and knowing what God demands of us and desires of us. You see, God says, listen, if you obey me, my promise is to you and to a thousand generations, there's blessings in honoring the Lord and putting God first in your life. And that blessing is passed down from generation to generation. And I thank God for my family, for those who ahead of me answered the call of God on their hearts, responded and sacrificed and laid down their lives for the Lord. And given me the opportunity to hear the good news and respond to the message of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the message is more clear. They know the gospel. Thirdly, the call is to be answered because when God speaks and makes his truth known, it demands a response. We, more than anybody, need to be responsive to the tug of God on our hearts. And because of this, the rejection is tragic. For every person who's been raised in a Christian home that turns a deaf ear to the prodding of God's spear in their hearts and their lives, 
They are without excuse. The invitations are the first for the benefit of those who believe, but it doesn't stop there. It moves from targeted invitations to a more general universal appeal. What does he say? Here's what I want you to do. as my messengers. I want you to go into the main highways where everybody's at and find and invite as many people as you find. Who did Jesus die for? He died for the sins of the whole world. Especially for those who trust in the Lord. But it says he also died for the sins of the whole world. So that anybody who would respond can. Jesus says, come to me all. Everyone who is weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I'm meek and gentle in heart and humble, and you will find rest for your souls. This past couple of months as a leadership team, we get together on a weekly basis, and we've been looking over Proverbs and trying to learn, okay, what does this have to say for our lives and the development, our development as men and women of God? Because we can't lead anybody where we haven't been ourselves. And it's important that we're learning. I believe the, the best teachers are the ones who are learning the most. In Proverbs 6 and Proverbs chapter 7 has this incredible contrast. In chapter 6 he says, Beware naive ones. Because the temptress stands on the corner and she winks her eyes. And what's she trying to do? She's doing everything she can to tempt you to get off of God's path. Don't answer that call. Turn a deaf ear. In fact, turn around and run. They say, lust is a 90% neck problem, right? It's just don't look. <laughs> don't feed the eyes. The lamp of the body is the eye. If the eye is evil, the whole body is evil. If the eye is pure, the whole body will be pure. He says, beware, because there's somebody out on the corner on a daily basis seeking to lead you off of God's path. That's true. And Proverbs chapter 7 talks about wisdom. And now wisdom stands on the same street corner or in the same neighborhood in a different vicinity calling out to the naive one saying, come to me and learn from me. If you want to be wise, it's right here for the taking. All you've got to do is seek me. Seek me with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord and he will direct your paths and you'll be wise in this world. And you'll be free from the entanglements that ensnare so many. Every single day, wisdom calls out. God is tugging on our hearts to walk with him, to stay true to him. Just like every single day, there's voices in this world trying to get us off of God's track. Which will you listen to? He says, as many as you can find and will respond, they are welcome. And notice how the invitation is indiscriminate. He says, who was invited to come and who came? Both good and evil. You don't have to get cleaned up to come to God. Just come to God as you are. He'll clean you up. That's what he does. You just have to be willing to let Christ do his work inside of you. I know for me, sometimes I come home and I do construction sometimes. And working with tile, I'm working with drywall, I'm all these different things, you, you get dirty. You, you, my wife's like, man, don't, don't come in this house with your shoes on, okay? I don't like the trail that you're leaving behind. And I'll come in, she's like, did you see the, the car seat? I, I don't want you sitting in my car seat, man, when, you're, when you come home from work. I just, you, you, you all these little speckles of rock and whatever. I, I, I want a clean car. Of course, me, I walk hands, so I'll take my shoes off outside and I'll take my clothes off at the door and I'm just kidding, I don't do that, I do that. <laughs> but I'll walk in, I'm getting ready to sit down and my wife's like, what are you doing sitting down? 
I'm like, I'm resting and relaxing. And she's, you're resting and relaxing? Man, you are a filthy mess. How can you rest and relax like that? Would you please go shower? I'm like, would you get off my back? <laughs> can I sit down for a minute? She goes, yeah, you know, but you, you can, but how can you be comfortable as messy as you are? That's gross. That's not re relaxing. That's like a pig laying in the mud. It's yuck. And sometimes I'm just too lazy to get up, jump in the shower, and then come out and relax. And when I do, she's at peace, and I'm at peace. But it's so it is with God. You know what? We come to the Lord, and he's like, I'm here to clean you up. Well, I, let me be. I just want to do what I'm doing. Life is usual. Turn a deaf ear. And he's like, that, that's not resting. Don't, don't be a dog returning to the vomit. Don't do that. Listen to me. Come to me just as you are and respond to my work in your life. You'll never be the same. The invitation goes out to all. God is no respecter of person. He's no discriminator. And he's no pushover as well. No matter what you're going through, God has the answer to get you past it. But you've got to turn to the Lord. We've got to respond to his invitations. Things will not change by accident. They'll change automatically, but only as we surrender to what God is speaking and accomplishing in our lives. It's responding to his invitation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And when we let him in, he comes in and makes his abode with us. So let's take a closer look at the responses this morning. We'll look at first the negative responses. And this is the tragic reality. And there's five of them, but we're going to look at the first four right now. The first response was they were unwilling to attend. God opens up his heart he opens up his wallet, so to speak, makes all this available to his honored guests, and they're not willing to respond. They had other things, other obligations they would rather do. Later we see they were, they were even re annoyed at the continued requests of the Father. Did you notice that, that God keeps on sending people out to make the invitations known? God wants us there. But they didn't care. I remember a dad telling me he, when he had kids, he, he had twins and a little girl. And he says, man, I, I used to love coming home because every time I walked through the doors, my kids would be at the window. Dad's home! And as soon as I walked in, they come running up, oh, dad! And they gave me all their attention, all their affection, and it made me feel good as a man. And then my kids grew up to be teenagers. <laughs> he said, I'd walk home. they see, Dad's home. Get run out of here. Go to the room. And he could never get that same respect or feeling back. And can I say this? As children, may we never lose that sense of awe and wonder for God that love for our heavenly father who welcomes us into his presence the beginning of wisdom Proverbs tells us is the fear of the Lord it's living with a sense of wonder and awe for God or of God secondly they paid no attention to the requests to the invitations and did you notice that plural it's a sober reminder of the hardening effect of tuning God out. You see, the more we reject God's overtures, the more we ignore that still small voice that's speaking to our hearts, the less we notice God's gracious appeal. And that's the tragedy. The more apt we are to not respond. That's the tragedy of the wedding feast. 
And the text goes on to say they went their own way. One to his farm, another to his business, another back to his family. In other words, they went back to life as usual. Still others went so far as to mistreat the messengers that kept making God's appeal on his behalf. And it reminds me of the tragedy of misplaced priorities. The number one commandment is, have no other gods before me, or besides me. Make me first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what's his promise. Everything else will be added. But we've got to keep God first. Letting other things that are important get in the way of most important was the tragedy of this story. And that is an ongoing proper response to God is the appropriate response. Finally, we're told that they were not worthy. In other words, they didn't value their place in God's eyes. They didn't value their invitation. And the message couldn't be more clear. We can't be so busy that we fail to give God what he demands. In this world, that we can't be so busy that we fail to give God what he asks for and what he deserves from our lives. You see, we would all be wise to keep the chief aim of man in our hearts at all times. What's the chief aim of man according to the scriptures? Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Just whatever you're engaged in, let God be glorified. Put the spotlight on him. He's on the throne. And our text concludes with a positive response. Look, what does the text tell us? It says, the wedding hall was filled. Here it is. When you get the invitation by God and the Holy Spirit pricks on your heart, respond. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and I will make my abode with him. I will live with you. When God knocks, answer. Secondly, we're to respond and we need to respond appropriately. Did you notice there was a man who responded who wasn't dressed in wedding clothes? And I would say there's always a level of appropriateness with God. You see, Jesus uses this parable because at weddings, we dress up. We, we give the ceremony the, on, the honor and the dignity it deserves. And when we don't, it stands out. This man showed up, but he didn't take to heart the significance of the occasion. You see, free doesn't mean cheap. The freedoms we enjoy in America today didn't come without the sacrifice in the investment of lost lives. Blood was shed. Lives were lost for us to enjoy the freedoms we have today. It isn't cheap. It's of great value. And the invitation that God gives us isn't cheap. It's free, but it isn't cheap. It cost him his son. God deserves our best. God knows it and we know it. God, his work, his agenda, his service, his glory deserves the best we have to offer at all times. This man's end is meant to get our attention because our place for eternity is of utmost importance. What does he say? This man who didn't understand the value of what he has been given, he treated as unholy something that was holy. He says, send him out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why does Jesus tell us this? Because he wants us to wake up. It was meant to wake them up to their reality. The, the people that are listening to the message that Jesus is giving are people who've been invited to the feast who are not attending. They're rejecting the one God has sent. And if they don't repent, they would feel tremendous remorse for what could have been. You know what the worst thing about hell is going to be? I don't think it's going to be the pain and the suffering 
physically. It's going to be emotionally of missing out. Things do not have to be the way they are. Why didn't I respond when I had the choice? Luke chapter 16, Jesus says, Lazarus, a poor man, and a rich man died. And Lazarus, all he had was his faith, but the rich man had all, everything in the earth, but didn't have a walk with God. The rich man perished. He, he went to hell. The place of the dead, separated from Abraham's bosom, it tells us. And he says, I, I long just for one drop of water that Lazarus enjoys today. Something to appease my anguish. And he says, the chasm is too far. It cannot be traversed. And then he says, may I go back and warm my family? Can, can I tell my brother? Can I tell my mom, my dad? Can I tell everybody I know that doesn't know you? Listen, it doesn't pay to live life our way. It doesn't pay to reject God. It doesn't pay to reject his overtures. Respond. And what does Jesus say? He says, listen, you know what? You could go back and tell them, but if they don't listen to my word, they don't listen to my spirit, they won't listen to you. So many times we think they're not responding because they're not hearing. No, they're not responding because they don't want God. And they don't value what he has to offer. And here's the point Jesus is making. We have all we need right now to respond appropriately. That was the message of the leaders he was speaking to. We have all we need to respond appropriately. Let's give God what he's looking for. What is it? Grateful hearts. That we would appreciate all that God has done for us and made available to us. With loving hearts that we value relationship with God more than anything else in this world. That we would have faithful and loyal hearts who make God our primary loyalty, our primary counselor, the one we turn to first when we're looking for an answer or looking for direction. That we would have responsive hearts that are alive to God and alive to the things of God. That our hearts would beat for God's agenda in this world. And lastly, we'd have a rejoicing and celebratory heart. Taking the time to acknowledge, celebrate, and respond by basking in God's glorious presence. He makes the invitation for this feast. He makes it available to each and every one of us, whoever will respond. And the answer is respond and lose yourself in his glory. Reminds me of the old worship song that moved me when I was in college. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Father, every day, draw me close to you. Take away today. If you want to know how much God loves us, values a relationship with us, just look at the hands and feet of Jesus. The invitation for eternity with God has gone out. The expense has been covered and the feast has been prepared. The only thing God requires of us is an appropriate response. Yes, Lord. Yes, I'll be there, I'll be ready, and I can't wait to share.